Okay, you know what I think we'll do is we'll, we'll go ahead and kick this off. Um, we have 14 people in here already. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, if you're in the right spot, we're with uh, app application development with uh, serverless and containerization. And we're doing an Ask the Expert, Experts channel uh, today, panel. Um, the experts here today, uh, you see one on the screen, and one is currently trying to get in right now. So we're just going to kick this off. Uh, Biljan uh, Ibram, uh, why don't you go ahead and take a couple minutes and, and give a little background on who you are and what you do. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bill Um I am I'm, I'm work for Red Hat, uh, currently as a product manager. But before that, I have been a consultant architect for many years, working with customers on customer projects, doing primarily uh, what we call middleware, so integration. Um, uh, I am also a committer for uh, some Apache projects, such as Apache Camel, and I have uh, I have books around Apache Camel and Kubernetes. Hello. Uh, in, in the last couple of years, we moved uh, most of our middleware to Kubernetes and OpenShift. So I have started using also um, Kubernetes, mostly from user point of view. So I'm not so much interested in how you install manage, but how you use Kubernetes, how you create applications for it. Um, that, that's me briefly. Okay, and you saw flying in like Superman is uh, Rule Halsemans here. Rule, you get a couple minutes to tell everybody who you are. Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Give me a quick sign. Yeah, okay, cool. That helps. Uh, my name is Rule Halsemans. I'm a principal solution architect in the Netherlands. I um, used to cover basically the whole region from a middleware perspective. So, in Red Hat terms, that means OpenShift and everything on top. And the last year, I've been ma mainly focused on FSI customers. Um, and I've been advising customers on all kinds of things. Uh, Eric and I had a couple of summit sessions on uh, pitfalls for the hybrid open multi-cloud, as well as microservices in general. Um, and um, I have the utmost respect for everybody here. Um, and I hope to hear uh, all kinds of awesome questions. So uh, please, hope everybody's safe, by the way. Be safe. All right. All right. Thanks, Rul. Um, and, and again, I'm, my name is Eric Chabelle. I'm a portfolio architect director uh, here at Red Hat. I've been with Red Hat about 11 years, spent three years in the field doing what Rul does as a solution architect and quite a bit of time in the, the, the middleware BU, uh, our business unit where we make all those products that you guys like. Um, for the last almost three years now, I've been uh, working at the portfolio level, uh, taking a much broader look. Uh, today, my role is just to moderate. So Hopefully, I won't have to answer too many of the questions. You see on the right uh, a, a chat window there. Um, be careful that you're uh, selecting the track chat, not the event chat. I'll try to keep an eye on both. But if you stay in the if track chat, then uh, we can we can gather your questions if you have any. Um, but to kick it off, so um, from what I heard from uh, uh, from Bilgen, I was kind of curious what your take is on. Uh, uh, modern application development. If we look at things like cloud native, where everybody's headed, and the containers part of this track. Uh, we just saw Daniel O talking about some of the the Quarka stuff and all the really speedy ways to do things. Really fun and fantastic. But when you start getting out there in the real world, it's about tying together all the complexity that you already have in place, right? Um, so people have for quite some time been talking about uh, definitely in the camel space about the uh, microservices and things like that. But we have monoliths, we have microservices, we have containers. So give me a little tour to kick us off here of, of what your vision is as you roll into this space, you know, having your monoliths, dabbling in the microservices as a company, and then where do we go from there? Well, okay, that, that's <laughs> uh, a, a big question. But uh, if we, if we look at it, what's been happening uh, in the last decade, I'd say we had the monolithic application uh, where we've been following primarily service-oriented uh, architecture with probably something like an ESP as an implementation. And the main problem there was that it turned into bottleneck, bottleneck both from technological point of view and also from people point of view because you had services that are leaking logic into the into the middleware so it become hard to um, scale and update those and then microservices gave us a set of principles and help us how we split monoliths into uh, independent uh, components but 
early generation of microservices, they didn't have the right tooling. So you end up creating microservices that have to do its own uh, configuration management and its own service lookup and, uh, and and lots of other things. So your microservices have to do too many things. And the way uh, Kubernetes uh, and cloud native uh, development and all other projects around Kubernetes change that is it, it kind of gives us the the, the right uh, abstraction to manage multiple microservices and it, it kind of takes all of the infrastructure responsibilities from your application. Now you can focus more on writing your business logic uh, uh, in your microservice and get other capabilities either from the platform like Kubernetes, it will do for your health check, configuration management, service discovery and things like that. And if you need other capabilities, you can add them uh, as a sidecar, et cetera. So you don't have to uh, mess up with your application. And I, I think uh, both microservices ideas and Kubernetes kind of enforce uh, each other uh, and helps to you know, each other's uh, uh, adoption and popularity. Uh, th this way I'll leave for now, Let's see what Royal says. Yeah, I was, I was I was waiting for my chance and Eric knows me quite well, so <laughs> he was like, oh. <laughs> um, the one thing I think that that most of my organization or the organization that I speak to uh, need to think about first is actually not the technology. And like Bill, Bill and already touched upon it, right? One of the things that we did wrong with SOA is that our organizations weren't ready for it. And what I see people struggle with most is not the technology. It's the, it's the understanding people and process that goes with the technology is a big deal. And also, I see too much people think, okay, if I just insert a tool, all my problems are solved. Um, and what what I what I can can relate to is that um, obviously you occasionally uh, look at uh, like Kubernetes in general and OpenShift in specific. Self service is key, right? And and all the wait queues and everything. Uh, yes, a tool can help with that, but. What it cannot do is, if you don't have an established baseline, give you a number of how much it helps. So if you don't do your due diligence and get, you understand where you're coming from, you might think you're doing great. And in practice, it's a little bit more difficult than that. Um, so I'm completely with Bilgin. To me, it's in the top, uh, top left. Um, Technology will help. Technology will certainly give you now tools that we never had before, but it still does not excuse you to look at your people and your process first and establish a good baseline for you to understand what's the gain you're having. Yeah, that's absolutely a good point. I agree 100% with that, but we've talked quite a bit about with that one. Um, we have a question in the chat, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dump it in. It's, it's not going a complete right turn. We've already talked a little bit about how you're you know taking these technologies and where you're going with this stuff. Um, but as a regular developer, can I or should I use containers even if my company doesn't have them in production? And I'll add something to this too at the end, so you guys can kick this one off. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a quick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, 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 Bill. Quick, uh, <laughs> uh, quick answer. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's not clear here why he, uh, 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 Langdom is uh, reluctant of using containers. So maybe he can clarify that. Uh, but containers and the related technologies such as Kubernetes have been around, I think, now over five years. Not sure, but uh, there are lots of companies using them in production. So I don't see. Uh, any concern from 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 that side, but in order to use containers, it, it, it's not just about Docker. You know, there is a uh, you 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 need buying from quite a lot of people, especially from the off side, and you, you will need buying from a big part of your uh, company and organization. It's not like using a library that just a developer decision, but it impacts lots of teams. Uh, so that you will definitely need support from them. I think there is some uh, follow-up clarification. But my, I don't make decision about what my company uses in production. The admins do. Yeah, th this is the point. So you will definitely need buying from admins uh, uh, to to use containers in my view. Well, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, um, there there's two, two aspects to the story, right? One is. 
um, how do I, as a lowly developer, change a complete organization? And um, that that is an aspect that we can help with. It, it, it's partly due to having the right arguments, explaining why containers are better, um, establishing reluctance. So for me, as a regular developer, why should I use containers? Because I want to share with my, my peers. Uh, that would already be a gain. Uh, Sure, it wouldn't be a gain in production, but perhaps by establishing credibility, uh, they'll listen better to the arguments that you're making to support your argument that uh, the handover problem, we all had calls. I mean, I mean Bilgen, uh, Eric, myself, we all had calls and and there were, it, it works on my machine, right? Uh, and all the buzzword bingo that you can associate with that, right? Who's gonna pay for fixing that it doesn't work on the other machine, right? Um, if you leave that behind, what developer should I use containers for, even if my company doesn't use them in production, is actually because um, we used to have the issue that um, we had a, a good desktop where we installed everything onto, and then you had the one project leak into the other. Even if you just use the, 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 the Docker container inside your developer laptop or VDI or whatever have you not, um, you already get a benefit that it's a self-contained unit. And as soon as you nuke it, uh, you still have the binary. So if you want to restart it later, you still can. can. And if you don't, um, it's not leaking anything into other parts of your system. So I would say it's already a benefit just as a singular developer. But if you go the right way, or at least a more sustainable way, then I would highly recommend in, in using that knowledge and that leverage to change your organization bottom up, and obviously, happy to help. Right. Now, as you as you can see, you're talking to two very big enterprise oriented, you know, experienced developers who've been out there a while and seen these bigger sets and stuff. I'm going to take this and flip it on its head really quick and introduce it in the sense of what I think he's trying to hit. Also, is when you get to a small organization, you're just a simple developer, or maybe just getting started. You don't have all this large infrastructure. You don't have all these container platforms to play with. What are you doing and what does that look like and should you be doing that? And I've, I've seen a couple of small, really small ones where it's quite, quite fun to see how it's being applied without forcing it all the way into production. I would love to see it go all the way to production. So would they, they understand that it's a long-term project to change an org. We just talked about that, but imagine you have your code in, in like something simple like GitHub and, and generating the containers out of that to just run them locally as a developer experience, whether it's going on a container platform or not. That takes not only the project being in a code repository that I can check it out, mess with it, mess it all up, and then throw it away and check it out again and start over. You now have a complete platform that's repeatable in a container to run your code on that's always going to be the same. So, yes, there's a lot of reasons to be using containers, even if it's not going to production, right? It's just going to speed up your cycle. Rules got something to add. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, and we shouldn't forget that maybe containers aren't the answer, right? Uh, maybe serverless is already. So depending on the, the rules and compliance you have to take to in account in your particular organization, you could even skip containers and go to function as a service or something similar if that helps with solving your problem. I'd argue that even a monolith works better in a container, but depending on, on what you're doing, um, maybe serverless is the best option for you. Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce a, a new topic here. Um, when we look at things like integration and, and data usage and uh, the, the traditional having a, a database layer or a storage layer somewhere in your organization or in your, in your projects, that's a single source of truth. You hear that, that, that term a lot, single source of truth. But as we get towards these cloud native uh, uh, container based uh, solutions and how you're running stuff like that, we're seeing more and more integration along the lines of like uh, event driven architectures where now your single source of truth is being moved up out of the storage layers into the application layers. What are you guys seeing around that? What do you think of that? And, and the biggest question that I got asked around this is, when do you think this is a good idea? And when would it not be a good idea to be using things like event-driven event architectures? Rule, why don't you go first? This one is all yours. <laughs> oh. So who's going, Rule? This is this is absolutely your alley. 
Oh, not sure why you you, you think that. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, there is a. I didn't hear a concrete question, but <laughs> uh, a broad topic. But if maybe I'll start with looking at the um, types of um, messages, you know, and how do we get to event driven? If you look at the uh, uh, message type, sometimes you want uh, your messages, uh, let's say, to be. Uh, uh, they, they can be temporal, you know, you may have, uh, let's say something like a stock ticker or something coming from IOT. So you have messages that can, uh, you can afford to lose them. So these are short, short lived messages. Then you can have messages that, uh, that have to be consumed once and you can have messages that you want to consume multiple times. So if you look at from life cycle, from the message life cycle, you can have different kind of needs. Then you, you look at, uh, uh, you, you look at, uh, uh, even if you look at from that side, I would say um, you, you don't have uh, you, you don't need to go directly to uh, what I'll say to event driven uh, event driven architects. You you still can go to traditional uh, messaging or even uh, interactions that are request response driven. So, so we, we, without uh, uh, messaging. So uh, I, I'm not like a, a thinker that you should always go to event driven architecture directly. You, you can choose different uh, flavors of messaging. You know, I, I want to start from there. And uh, I wonder, I think Raul may have something to add uh, to this before diving yeah. to the data side. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm thinking, so what I what I see happening, and, and I, I know that's why I said it was, was written on your, 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 your uh, well, written on you, uh, Bilgen, was basically mainly around the issue of what you have Regardless of whether you go event driven or, or request response in a, in a in the microservices uh, world, is the data duplication issue. And uh, uh, right, every every set of microservices, every every value stream uh, has its own set of data. And what what helps is if you if you think about it that that the old data stores. Uh, used to just sync via some kind of syncing mechanism in the database and an application developer would never have to worry about, well, what I'm going to do and where do we're going to write my state into. And what we see now with the current setup is actually that that doesn't scale anymore. Uh, the single database sort of through where everybody is using the common data model, it just does not work. And what you then can do is split up your data, but then you have the problem, hey, how do I keep my data in sync? How do I scale it across latency zones? How do I collect all the data from various sources to give my single, for instance, I'm working in a call center and I have to see everything what a customer is consuming. I don't yeah. care if it's in lending, in insurance and in mortgages, I just want a single overview. And that's where you get into the really interesting world where integration spills, it plays a huge role. And regardless of whether you're using Kafka with Mirror Maker to consume across multiple environments, you're reading database logs with Debezium and change data capture to make sure that everything is eventually consistent. Um, maybe you're even choosing to go um, uh, full on, uh, always consistent and, and, and play with availability or partition tolerance. But Regardless of what you're doing, is, is I think the key thing is that you think about what you're trying to achieve. And if you're, you're certain what you're trying to achieve, and if you test it yourself to see if having, um, how do you say, uh, a tunnel vision, that's the English term, sorry, I was thinking of the Dutch term, um, and, and um, take a step back and look, is this the right uh, solution for the job? And um, I see in practice a lot of microservices that are still talking to a common data model and basically are a half SOA, half microservices thingy. Um, and, and I think data and, and how you structure your data and how you collect your data and how you keep it in sync will be key for everybody to make a successful play on uh, application uh, development and serverless and containers and all that jazz all the hype words. If you want to be successful, that's one of the points I would highly recommend that you tackle after people have done. 
Okay, that, that brings up a nice topic. So if we if we segue that uh, uh, change and messages and data left, right, uh, moving all over the place, and then take that into the cloud. So now we're taking our cloud native thing actually into the cloud, not just our development environment locally and stuff. Now, I know you and I will have had lots of talks about how, how cloud providers are charging a lot of money to move data around. What does that look like? Uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, we can get a little input from, from uh, uh, Bilgen about uh, what are you looking at and how are you designing these message systems when they're going to be hosted in the cloud, where when you're transferring data around, it tends to cost quite a bit of money when it's coming in and out of the cloud, right? Yeah. Uh uh, yeah, that, that, that's a, a good question. Now, I mean, the data, it has multiple dimensions. They call it multiple Vs, you know, uh, but uh, one of the uh, uh, interesting one is velocity. So it's actually when you move to cloud, one of the hardest things probably is to get your data there and to, to process it there. And uh, if you look at all these cloud providers, they, uh, they all have... Uh, tools to move your data from on-premise to cloud. You know, they all have some kind of migration utility from on-premise database to their database. But from there on, there are not many to move around to other cloud providers or back to on-premise. And uh, the, pro the project I'm working on right now is Debezium. So Debezium is uh, an open source change data capture that can help you uh, m move data uh, be, be, between different cloud providers, uh, and that, that, that's something, uh, uh, yeah, our uh, uh, readers here should uh, have a look. Uh, and then another air related area I've been involved is uh, specifically around data abstraction and data virtualization. And uh, uh, and one of the common needs there is uh, processing uh, data where it uh, where it lives. You know, your application may be running on the cloud, but actually the data uh, typically will come on some on-premise uh, data sources and you have to combine that with some other um, maybe data sources on the cloud. And uh, there is a big uh, a need for actually processing data where it is without uh, moving around. And, and other considerations specifically around uh, security, you know, can you move data to a specific region or cloud provider. If you move it there, you know, how can you encrypt it? It's not only about encryption of the data um, uh, on move, but also encrypting it uh, uh, where it's stored. So there are multiple uh, areas to consider. Uh, we, could, we could expand into all, all of these. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you, if you look at it, um, um, as a red, we're, we're working on quite a few projects, right? We we've got, as as Billion rightfully mentioned, uh, the Bezium. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about uh, is, is 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 obviously we can we can read to, with the Bezium. And keep me honest here, Billion, it's your product. Is is read the, the the database log and make sure that that messages from there can get put on the Kafka bus, and Kafka can replicate that cross cloud, no problem. Uh, we got Mirror Maker. There's a couple of other options, and then you can use those those events to make sure that you have the right data on the other end, regardless of whether it's another cloud or if it's uh, if it's the same cloud but a different uh, availability zone, or maybe it's on-prem. Uh, doesn't really matter. The, the fact is, you need something to keep that in sync. Um, Another thing that uh, that Red Hat is already also investing in is Copper, which is also a way to uh, go across multiple clouds and to see if we can connect those together and make sure that uh, communication is smooth and, and effortless between those. Uh, a third option would be Submariner and all its associated products where we go layer three and, and try to keep separate clusters connected to each other. Um, so there's plenty of ways to, to think about, uh, about your strategy and how to make sure that you're leveraging the key components of the cloud there eh? Um, like uh, Cosmos DB or something similar that, that are re 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 unique selling points. Um, there's a there's Google has some some awesome stuff. Microsoft has some awesome stuff. Amazon has obviously awesome stuff as well. So what you need is actually a system that connect all of these together and use the unique selling points of each and every cloud there. And I think if you if you're if you're Thinking about your data strategy, and like Billion said, keep the processing where it's necessary, leverage the tool where you need it, 
but also leverage tools like the Bezium and all the others I just mentioned to connect all of these when you need it, then you're truly doing the open hybrid multi-cloud. And then you're basically awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And also think about uh, just a little tie into that. You have special workloads and stuff that are probably not the ones you're going to want to pump up into the cloud, like the the, the analytics and the, the the AI and the ML stuff, where you're turning over a lot of data. Do you see them doing that in the cloud, or do you see them doing more of that on their on-premise data? I see a little bit of both. If if you talk about training models, it's typically something that you need a lot of computing power for, but you don't need it all the time. So if you look at, 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 at those kind of things, I can see an absolute brilliant use case for the, for the, for the public cloud. Um, if it comes to running the actual models, uh, then I see a mixed area. I still see a lot of public cloud uh, consumption, and why not? I mean, it's, it, it, it's managed for you. It works really, really well. And if you have a good relationship with your cloud provider, you can probably get a really sweet deal on, on, uh, as well. But if you have still a large in install base on-prem and you have the specific hardware to do it, then uh, maybe it makes more sense to do it on-prem. It, it basically depends on, on where's your data. And I'm going to tie back to what Bilgen said. You want to do your processing close to where your data is. And if that data is on-prem, then running the model on-prem with uh, proper hardware is probably better or cheaper. Uh, well, cheaper is a form of better um, than running it in the public cloud. But honestly, I think for training the models, the public cloud is pretty tough to be. Billion? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, just what, what you described, uh, the training. A part you need lots of compute on demand, so that that that's the uh, reason. And uh, if we think out a, a, a bit on the traditional databases, they've been optimized both for storage and processing. But now there is a move more to store data on file-based storage. You know, just move it to some cloud service and process it uh, process it there. So the storage is really cheap, and you start up compute only when you need. So there is definitely move towards uh, data lakes, file-based storage, formats such as Parquet, et cetera. Um, this was happening. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a switch here because I have one here that's like underlined three times, uh, a question for you guys. Um, <laughs> um, let's take it down to, uh, I have these monoliths, you know, this is how my organization has worked. Now we're moving to look at how do we make this thing ready for the cloud and how we're going to make it container native and how are we going to uh, approach this? What would be a, a good strategy for something like that? Uh, would you want to just dump it in a container and see what happens and then work from there? Or would you want to, everybody would love to rewrite the whole thing, but that's not always possible, right? So if you're going to get a phased, safe approach over time, how would you do this? Why don't you start, rule? Yeah. So I, I, I was like, I want this one. Um, so um, actually, I'm a little bit. Um, uh, so on, on the one hand, I would say put it in the container, or even better, use OpenShift virtualization, put your monolith into your container platform. Uh, sorry, Kubefert, obviously, in the, in the upstream community. Uh, and then start strangling. But what you see in practice is that might not be the best solution ever. Uh, first, you need to look at, is the monolith actually a bad thing? Um, because uh, a microservice is, is a mono, monolith with latency. Um, so, so do you need your independent scalability? Um, if the answer is yes, uh, start, can I separate my monolith into domains? Uh, if the answer is no, you might get a better result if you just re-architecture it. Um, if the answer is yes, then you uh, would be one of my key candidates to put it in a container or even a, a Kubevert virtual machine. Uh, put it inside your container platform and then start strangling the monolith. Um, and that basically means carving out functions, putting them into mi microservices or whatever, and maybe function as a service, depending on the size, obviously, and uh, what makes most sense, and if you want to scale to zero. And if you've done that, uh, then you can slowly ease the monolith 
into or carve the monolith into a new uh, form. In practice, I see mostly put the stuff into a container and uh, shove it on the public cloud and call it uh, a new uh, a new cloud native architecture. Um, <laughs> And a little bit of greenfield, um, but I'm hoping that uh, that Bilgen has better experiences than I have. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. So I'm I'm also very practical. I mean, my, uh, uh, when I work with customer, my, typically uh, the starting point would be you know if it works, don't touch it, let it run as long as it can. And then if you if you are not happy with the way a monolithic application works, is probably with, First, probably there is quite a lot you can gain even without doing microservices. You know, if you just try to uh, to see where, where is the bottleneck in your uh, uh, in your release cycle. You know, why it's taking three months rather than three days, and just by improving some, um, uh, just by doing some scripting and CI/CD and automation, probably there is quite a lot you can gain just by uh, having a monolith. Uh, and that, that's been described, I think, in one of the Red Hat blogs around uh, like the Majestic Monolith or uh, something around that uh, that title. And uh, if that's not good enough, uh, uh, when you want to go to microservices, the probably the most common mistake I've seen with customers is being overly optimistic and splitting a uh, one big monolithic application to 50 to 100 microservices. And that's typically a good sign for me. Like. Uh, probably one monolithic application should be split first to you know five to ten maximum, in my view. If you go to up to hundred, it uh, quickly uh, you're going into territory you have no experience with. Obviously, you've been operating a monolith before that, and you're getting into uh, operating overly uh, fine-tuned nano services, and that that's uh, that that's typically is followed up by the realization that you have too many small microservices, maybe you should merge them back, etc. So uh, I would say start very small, you know, start with monoliths and split it to a few microservices. And then, you know, there is a long journey towards the cloud and serverless, but that's a good start. Yeah, that's I, kind I, of I love that, uh, Bilgen. It's, it's, it's actually to the point. It's um, it, you're basically trading a, a single single deployment unit where most of them of the customers have trouble uh, doing lifecycle management on this on this monolith, uh, and then you're adding not not just one extra, but you're adding dozens of extras. And uh, new slash, it doesn't get that much easier unless you you're going advanced use cases and write operators or stuff like that. So. Uh, maybe starting small is actually quite sensible. So I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you on that one. Man. Yeah, I also think it's worth mentioning, we kind of glance over it a lot of the times, but the, the lifecycle management and how your organization needs to be ready. So I, I laugh quite hard when you say hundreds of microservices. Uh, most organizations start struggling with the first five, right? I mean, you don't understand the concept in the beginning of, hey, now that I've built this, I own this. I own the lifecycle, I own the versioning, I own the API. Uh, you basically become a little self-contained development unit, a business to business with the rest of the development units that own other microservices. So inside your organization, it's as if you're dealing with a third party API or something like that. So you split it out into hundreds, all of a sudden these little development teams have too much on their hands and you know the standard organization wasn't ready for that. that, that you see that a lot. Um, okay. I want to want to capture that a sure. little bit. Sooner. Um I actually have a use case, and and the vision was actually one of the examples we're positioning, is it where a customer uh, went to a decentralized model. So um, all the regions of that particular customer have their own databases and their own set of services, and now they want to bring it back together to a single point of truth. Because uh, the fact is, if one of the regions has an issue of an outage none of the others can take over because they can't access the data of the other one. And, yeah. and, um, but we also can't change the application because the application is a monolith that, uh, that was built 10 years ago and nobody dares to touch it anymore. So this is actually where we're positioning the Bezium uh, to, to read the logs of the database because we can't also, we can't sit between the database and the application because we don't know what, what might happen and then bring the data back to a centralized point and then start in carving it up the right way. 
So actually, we're not doing microservices. We're bringing it back to kind of monolithic common data model first to fix the issue that they're not in control of what the region did and what they uh, did with their data. So um, as William said, if you go all out and go all microservices, you can wind up like this, this particular customer where you have all kinds of small things and nobody's taking care of the, what, what the other is doing anymore. And then you're running into all kinds of issues when you want to combine the data back again for, for instance, your single point of truth. Um, so what he said is completely, utterly awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just say I maintain a, a spreadsheet which is at microservices.fail and there are like hundreds of posts when microservices fail and from what you're describing it seems maybe the reverse cycle has started going back to morally <laughs> I don't know maybe up to level we went we went over the peak of inflated expectations and now we're in the throw of disillusionment right <laughs> okay, as, our, as our last time that's a perfect segue into to, to wrapping this stuff up here um, we have a little bit of time left so Let's talk a little bit about when, so you just basically described the process of going out to model lists and breaking them up and then, wait a minute, maybe we went too far, let's go back this way. Um, what about when you encounter that monolith where you say, okay, breaking this up doesn't make a lot of sense, um, but if I can improve it a little bit so that instead of having release cycles that take four months, eight months or whatever, that I can get them down to three months or two months, am I happy enough with that? You know, the, the fast moving monolith like we like to talk about. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Is that something you want to leave in place or do you have the realization that, hey, someday down the road, I don't want to get to the point where I'm, I have a monolith that nobody knows anything about? Yeah, but in the end, it, it, there's, only, there's only three wise men. Huh? Like uh, when, when you look at the problem, there's only three things that, that, that matter. One is uh, revenue, right? How much does it bring? Uh, the second is how much is, does it cost, and the third one, what's the risk, right? Um, and obviously, if it if it increases cost, uh, but it's a lower rate than it increases profit, more cost is worth it, right? So there's no, it's not always I need to decrease cost and decrease risk and increase value. It it just depends, right? Yeah. And if you look at it, um, to me, I think the trade-off is where it matters. So it doesn't make sense to run that monolith uh, 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 as a in a container, uh, uh, maybe multiple instances of the same monolith. Uh, it depends. It, it, does it bring revenue? Does it bring value? And, and revenue might be a little bit too much money focused, but uh, do I get a business gain out of it? Do I get a business gain out of decomposing that monolith? I don't know. It depends. It depends on every application has their own profile, their own way of doing stuff and the own reason why you should do it. Um, on average, I would, I would also look in um, talent retention as a factor in this. And this is something that lots of people forget and that's associated to the risk. Um, if you only have outdated monoliths running on uh, outdated legacy uh, engineering, I don't care how much you pay, I don't care how off, uh, awesome you documented this thing, Nobody wants to work with it anymore. So if you make the trade-offs and you keep all of these things in, 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 um, in vision when you plan this, I think a monolith could do awesomely. Uh, but I firmly believe that a, a, a serverless function, or, uh, with perhaps with written in Quarkus, is equally awesome. It just depends. You're going to hit the wall one day, right? <laughs> We've all yeah, been there. Uh, <laughs> mm, my, my, my view on this is I, uh, I, I kind of like collecting, let's call it patterns and what scales in terms of development, you know, what's repeatable, et cetera. And the migrations from monolith to microservices is, is like a, it's, it's a snowflake. It's one thing that uh, is unique in every customer, every application is, is different. And it's basically, <laughs> they're, they're not actually, you know, uh, so so many things you can uh, you can call as the best practices and uh, uh, and apply again and again. So my, where I'm getting is probably the best thing is if you can make the monolith uh, run fast, uh, uh, don't touch it too much, and maybe look at serverless and things such as Quarkus. You know that gives uh, life to Java in my view again. 
uh, for greenfield projects you know what can you do innovate with uh, with, with serverless and Quarkus with new things while you still have your monolith you know running uh, running there and maybe not if possible try not to uh, you know try to split it into microservices and touch it too much um, this is a... what I think developers love doing you know working on greenfield stuff <laughs> I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up at. It's a, a, a nice uh, segue into saying uh, bye bye to everybody that's joined us. Um, you can reach any of us online. We're fairly easy to find. So uh, feel free to reach out if you have more questions after this or anything you want to want to touch on. Uh, Biljan can even tell you about his book where he's got lots of Kubernetes patterns to share with you. Uh, really interesting stuff. I'd like to thank you, uh, Biljan and Rule, um, for joining us and spending a, a small hour here with everybody. And uh, see you all next time. Take care, Peace everyone. Out. Be safe. Thanks.